Faith in Birds by Marcus Perel Smith. The Leonin's fur was the color of sunset over the great desert, tawny with winding stripes of chestnut, and it was smooth and pleasant to the touch. The fascia underneath was warm, very warm, which meant the life growing just beneath the skin was healthy and strong. Niambi caressed it, knowing, continuing her delicate examination of Mother To Be's pregnant belly. Then she felt a kick. Good night, Captain Red Ram. Thanks for stopping in. Hope to see you in the future. Oh, that was a strong one, she exclaimed, her attentive human eyes lifting to meet her patient's feline ones. The expecting mother's whiskers quivered happily at the declaration, and the nostrils of her pink tiger nose flared. Her name was Pilar. Does that mean it's a boy? Pilar asked. Her jowl stretched to a wide simper, exposing, exposing a gleaming row of white canines. Hmm, could be, Miyambi replied coolly. He felt another kick. They both did, even harder this time. But girls have a bit more tenacity. She winked, and the two laughed. The child will be here any day now. Have you settled on a name yet? Pilar shook her head bashfully. Niambi gave her belly a brush and hand. My daughter was a kicker too, said Niambi. Kekia. It means fighter. That's what she was before she was born, a fighter. She was unhappy being stuck in such a tight space. When she arrived, early, I will add, it gave such a stretch, I thought she was ready to run down the street. I knew right that she ever put her mind to something would never be. Pilar smiled. Her mother's child. As Pilar spoke, she placed her hand on the zombies and gave it a small squeeze. The palm was rough, and the tiger pads that covered it were calloused from a life spent outdoors. A nomadic existence many refugees had but her five nimble digits, human-like, curled delicately. Her sharp claws remained retracted. It was a sign of deep gratitude. You have been such a friend, Robin, Alar began softly. And so many of your kind have not given us food and medicines, provide healing to our wounds, Give us words of hope that we will soon be safe beyond behind the city walls. For that we are so very grateful. Paused a moment. Her voice began to quiver with emotion. She asked, Are you not afraid the magistrate will shun you along with us outsiders? Outsider, Niambi repeated in her mind. The word carried such negative connotation. The Afravan had been wandering the great desert for hoping to escape the conflict spreading throughout their homeland. The southern nations were at war, and they sought to escape the violence and bloodshed. The aggressions were sparked by fears of invasion from an evil once thought to have been expelled from Dominaria, the Phyrexians. Outsiders trying to survive. Niambi smiled at Pilar's question, and then turned her hand over to take it fully in hers. She held it, allowing the thumb to gently comb. Oh, he had to speak. There we go. <laughs> Niambi smiled at Pilar's question then turned her hand over to take it fully in hers. She held it tenderly, allowing the thumb to gently comb over her soft fur. Her other hand remained on Pilar's swollen belly as she stared into the dark, amber-ringed well of Pilar's watering eye. There's no need to worry about me, he replied simply, but paused a moment 
as if processing a sad thought. Then she continued, I still hold sway with him. I still have his ear. Nyambi said the words with fervency, trying to convince herself that this were still true. Not called for her in three days now. Is it because you can read dreams? Nyambi chuckled softly. Oversimplified notion to mask her own apprehension. Well, not so much read, she replied. I find patterns, connections, a hidden within them or that become clear in time. Clarity calms the troubled heart. And in these times of trouble, we all need clarity. Alar's eyes were wide, quivering with tears that beckoned for more. Uh, for instance, in a recent dream, I saw a flock of birds searching for a home over a vast ocean. They were exhausted, having flown for days with no rest, until they came upon an island. On that island was a single tree. They were so thankful to have found a place to rest, but when they came to land on it, they saw it was sick with disease. Deadly insects were ravaging its bark and withering its fruit. With nowhere else to go, all hope seemed lost. But then the smallest of the flock dove into the bevy of branches where it disappeared. And what happened? asked Pilar in a way. Several followed the little bird and they found it eating the insects. <laughs> Niambi gave a small laugh. They all followed suit, devouring every bug under the until the tree was clear. Now the fruit could grow, and the tree could bloom. What does it mean? The birds are you, and this city is the tree. You are meant to be here, because there is something incredible within you. Really? asked Pilar, a hopeful gleam in her eye. What do we have in us? Well, I'm still working through the pattern, but eventually all eyes will be open to the truth. Pilar's gaze left. Eventually, Pilar muttered with disappointment. She knew, like Niambi, time was of the essence. A dangerous, ancient enemy was steadily approaching from over the horizon, one that would destroy anyone and everyone she held dear. They could not get behind the city walls. Yambi gave her hand an encouraging squeeze. Eventually, it's taking a bit longer than expected, but... We are ready. But we are ready, came a stern voice from behind them. Niambi turned over her shoulder, and Pilar sat up from her relaxed position on her cot. Behold a tall figure standing in the doorway of Pilar's makeshift tent. Against the setting sun, the cat ears and the pronounced whiskers gave the newcomer away as an afraven. But more than that, the muscular build and suit of armor showed them to be a strong warrior among the tribe. Niambi knew her. The wilderness had hardened her made her us uh, made her single-minded she was fiercely loyal to her and their safety was paramount stepped forward in tent, and the shadows on her tough face fell away exposing the wear of battle you take the words right out of my mouth czar ojanan said niambi standing and bowing her head in respect Please, Niambi, Alar groaned, her mood lifting instantly with her arrival. We are plast pleasantries. You are our family now. Even still, history looks kindly on descendants of the great Jaeger and Jedit Ojanan, true champions of Jamura, Niambi replied with a smile. Our greatest generals have studied their paths. They forever deserve our deference. Star moved forward and placed her hands warmly on her shoulders. 
And thanks to you, his legacy will be preserved. Sister, Pilar whispered, beckoning her to come. Zar hurried past Niambi and kneeled beside Pilar, falling into her open arms. The utmost tenderness, the two touched their foreheads together and purred into They were two inseparable who had endured so many hardships and heartbreaks, the most painful of which came directly from the magistrate. Three days prior, Niambi held audience with him and the Council of Voices in the Great Chamber to protest a decree handed down to the people of Femref that forbade them from donating food, medical aid, or the daily necessities one might need to survive in the harsh desert to the Afravan caravan. The council was comprised of ten people who sat in three levels above the ground in the circular Great Hall, each seat separated by an ivory pillar. Four of them sat on the first level, Three were on the second, two, first, and across them, seated upon a raised, embroidered throne of sorts, a hard-faced man of a ripe age and cloudy eyes, Siddhar Teshunda. Siddhar was the title given to him, as he was one of the highest-ranking generals and military tacticians in Femeref's history. His brilliance in battle came from the studying of ancient wars and battles throughout Jamura. He held a deep reverence for leaders who overcame insurmountable odds. Scholars, judicial and religious leaders, economists and army generals, both of human and dwarven birth, made up the Council of Voices. Each member was draped in flowing robes orange, white, and gold, with textured hoods draping their shoulders. Despite the occasional squabble over the allocation of certain resources and methods for expansion, the group consorted harmoniously, especially on the issue of the Afravan caravan. Throat cleared loudly, calling for attention. When their supplies run out, began one of the counselors, a hint of arrogance in her voice. And they understand that we will not replenish them. These tribes will do what they have done for years. Just move on. How is that, Council G Councilor Vega? Yambi asked the short-haired, small-faced woman seated at the center of the second level. How will they move on without water or food? There are those who are old and infirm. Pregnant mothers, too. Another figure leaned forward from a rather blithe, comfortable position, his hands clasped over his large belly. His name was Counselor Jabras, and he joined the dialogue. In the midst of conflict, dear woman, tough decisions must be made. We are unified on ours. But there's no conflict. We have one common enemy. The Phyrexian machine! Jabris exclaimed, nodding vigorously. There came a fearful grumble from the other council members. Its awakening was felt three weeks ago, as an earthquake in the ground. Femeref scouts returned to the city in a panic, with reports that a terrifying mechanical creature of gargantuan size and strength had emerged from the land, and it was steadily making its way to Femeref. It was on a mission of destruction, and it would reach the walls in just a few days' time. We are all on the same side, Niambi announced to them. Who is to say that is the case? The third vo opposing voice, a seasoned one, resonated clearly through the rotunda. Although the one who spoke, a man of rough, dark skin and white braided hair, had his face buried in a large book. The haughtiness of the tone grew just as clear. Niambi stared up at the man who was seated in the highest row. She almost had to squint to make him out. 
Though the sunlight was beaming through the many skylights spanning the ceiling, it was blocked by his head, cast his face in shadow. With several thin, raised scars laid vertical on his forehead, running into his braids, took Niambi's eye. He was one of the few who kept the more superstitious traditions. I can, Niambi replied firmly, refusing to bend to his heirs. You? Councilman Dung, nonchalantly turning another page in his book. The outsiders have only been here two weeks now. There's no way to know that they're true what they're truly capable of. I apologize, Niambi said sharply, her jaw tightening and eyes narrowing. But I do not believe I have met you before. Well, public servants like yourself are seldom invited to high council meetings. Councilman replied, ignoring Niambi's bristles. Speakers are relegated to their provinces, as you always have been. But our most honorable magistrate, for some uncertain reason, urged us to hear your complaint. To which I and the outsiders very much appreciate. Niambi fired back with a thin smile. She is a friend and loyal citizen of Femeref, announced Tashunda heartily. His voice was husky, and his phrases terminated with a croak. I take her counsel very seriously. It has been a great help over these many years, Councilman. Councilman? Niambi urged, almost demanding to know his name. Awate! The man slammed his book closed with a sound that echoed through the hall as he spoke. Grand Historian of Femeref. Hence silence fell over the room, as the historian and Niambi eyed each other. His face was now exposed. He appeared somewhat familiar. He was nearly the same age as the magistrate. The wrinkled skin about the eyes was similar to him. It was the long, shaggy white beard, however, that struck a chord in her. She had only seen the man up close once, at a burial ceremony for the previous. His beard was black then. Niambi was a novice in training at the time, and shadowing a speaker for the ceremony. Speakers played an integral role in reciting the rites and rituals of the dead, ensuring the spirits of those who had passed on were blessed properly. Solus was brought to their loved one. Those who recorded the success of the ceremony, ensuring the rites were upheld, were the historians. Owate was at the ceremony, tediously documenting what had transpired there. Tushunda cleared his throat, bringing Niambi's focus back to him and severing the line of scrutiny between Niambi and the historian. Then he spoke. Historian Oate brought some disturbing information about the Afraven to my attention. Oh? Niambi replied, turning over her shoulder to meet the magistrate's gaze. The Afraven tribes have had a rather sordid past, I'm told, he went on. They were aligned with Yogmoth at one time, and may be still. Niambi almost let out a laugh at the absurdity of the remark. Bishunda continued. Believe me, I had the same response. How could a people who had their homelands destroyed by that vile being and his decrepit offspring be consorts with evil? He paused to take a breath, then... The answer... His eyes motioned to the historian. They just don't know it yet, said Awate with a smile rising to his feet. I don't understand, said Niambi, appalled that he was entertaining the notion. Yogmoth's descendants are many, and they delight in the torture of our world's varied creatures, Awate began, especially those on the outskirts, those of the scattered tribes of Jamora. 
These tribes, you see, have little holding them together. No leader and no homeland to tie themselves to. So, it can be assured, assumed, assured that many a tribesman would have wandered off, alone, far from the little safety of the group. These individuals would indeed find themselves in such precarious situations, captured in a deadly Phyrexian hold. Their bodies would then be exploited, their innards replaced by such wicked machinery. Yogmoth is dead, answered Niambi. Basing your decision on old fears is folly. His legacy lives on nonetheless. He widened his address to the rest of the council. Who's to say one of these Afavrin, whom you so ardently protect, is not a possessed wanderer who later rejoined the Cat Tribe? Who's to say there aren't ten of these among them? Twenty! A hundred, even! You would condemn hundreds for fear of the possibility that one or two among them are sleeper agents. We can root them out after the Afavrins are safe, Niambi retorted. Not if their minds have been white, spoke Gabega. I've been told by numerous, completely credible sources that the enemy can steal your memories. You wouldn't know if you were infected until it was too late. The Phyrexians, Jabrisk exclaimed. The phrase was again followed by grumbles of the other council members, which were gradually growing into angry shouts. They were indeed unified in their rebuke. Awate continued to stoke the fire. There are Phyrexians out there, hiding in plain sight beyond the wall. And they wear the skin of cats. Sleeper agents, Yambu, added to Shunda, slowly standing to his feet gripping his embroidered wooden cane. He too had been stirred by Awati. We cannot take the risk. Not wrong kind of song there. Yambi stared back to them, outraged. You are all basing your prejudice on rumor and hearsay. Of all people, you should know hearsay is subjective, daughter of Teferi. We speak truth. Gritted her teeth at the Jabris, Vega, both sprang to their feet. Uh, uh, Phyrexians, will you shut up? Niambi shouted. Her voice boomed with a strike of thirty drums at once. It was a power she, as a speaker, had learned to call upon when addressing large crowds in open spaces. But these were confined quarters, which made the command that much more intense. The room immediately fell silent. Miyambi looked about the council, at their angry, scrunched faces. Her eyes climbed the rows until they met an enormous ivory bust of Asmira, the Holy Avenger, affixed to the largest pillar. She was a prophet whose wisdom and guidance had saved the city from destruction in the Mirage War, when the wizard Karavek tried to conquer northern Jamura. The bust was adorned with a bejeweled head and royal head dressing, surrounded by a halo of golden spears. Fiction, breathtaking. As the artist had captured her legendary beauty and fierceness perfectly. Her eyes looked down upon Niambi, standing in the middle of that room, amid so much aggression, and they seemed to smile with approval, urging her to continue the fight. Niambi rushed to the foot of the great seat, falling to one knee. Magistrate, Tashunda, please, do not be swayed by so much fear, I beg you. Come see the Afravran, talk to them. How dare you! How dare you speak to the Council of Voices in that way! shouted another member of the Council suddenly. She, she must be removed, Magistrate! asserted a second. Have her removed now! The 
council erupted in protest to Niambi's presence, every member stomping their feet and shaking their fists. Leaned into Tunda, aiming her words directly at his heart. Remember your word. Remember your dream. The birds. The tree. The pattern is getting clearer. And not be on the wrong side of it. Ashunda raised his hand, silencing her. The irate councilman it took a long moment to consider her before he spoke. The Council of Voices is united, he said with a forceful tone. Our decision to protect the city and rebuke those who cluster outside our walls is final and for the greater good. Tashunda, please, don't! Guards! Tashunda averted his eyes and Niambi tried to meet them. Escort our esteemed speaker out. We have other matters to attend to. Nothing is more pressing than this. Out! Tashunda shouted, driving Niambi back on the heels. We made great we made great progress today, said Zar with pride, bringing Niambi back to the present. The tunnel to the abandoned mine is complete. Good news, Niambi replied softly, although with a slight reluctance. But it is my hope the council will finally realize their error, and we will not have to go that route. It's easier to ask. It is easier to ask forgiveness than permission, responded. Zar spoke simply, pointedly, never wasting a breath. Her eyes narrowed as her eyes narrow as she looked upon Polar's belly. Especially when there are so many lives on the line. Niambi nodded, hearing her urgency and understanding it. A large part of her was afraid for them and what would happen next. Afraid the Phyrexians would murder and devour them. Even more afraid the Council's forces would stop them from making it a safe place. An abandoned gold mine she had found for them beyond the wall. The latter was something she dreaded to risk. I have told the caravan to prepare, Zar went on with a determined vigor. Only take what we can carry. When night falls and the first stars shine, we will move. That is the plan, Niambi affirmed. And your husband? Denik has assured me that every warrior has been called to the walls to defend the city. There will be no patrols where we are taking you. There now, setting the rest of your stores of food, wood, water. Paused a moment. What is it, Niambi? asked Pilar. Niambi took a breath. Folk. I I want to meet with the magistrate one last time. Zar's eyes widened with anger and surprise. Alone this time. I'm sure. I believe speaking with him, sitting down with him, without certain voices present, will change his mind. You have tried your best to advocate for us too many times already. Zar shot back at her, rising to her feet. The Phyrexian machine will be here at tomorrow's sunrise. Exactly why I must try again while there is still time. The punishment you face if we are found out will be severe. The Afavrin have faced far worse than survived. I know. I refuse to accept that you... Any of you would be put in prison, your sister left to give birth in a dungeon, without exhausting every effort. Phyrexian scum! Came a sudden, distant shout, cutting through their dialogue. It was followed by a bout of laughter, the laughter of several men. 
Neither Niambi, Zar, or Pal Palar had had to exit to know who was firing their curses. It was the soldiers on the wall. You'll die before you ever enter this city! Then the loud weeping of several elderly Afravan women slowly passing the tent took their attention. Niambi turned her head slightly over her shoulder in acknowledgement, allowing the women's cries to fulfill their full arc. Her heart broke for them. We will not wait! Dar roared with frustration, baring her sharp teeth. They all whipped them. They think we are monsters, Niambi! Unbeknownst to her and Pilar both, the palms of Niambi's hands began to take on a soft glow, turning the skin from a light blush to a quiet, simmering saffron. The eyes of Azmira flashed in Niambi's mind. The Magistrate will see reason, Niambi pushed. He will see truth. Pilar, who had been laying on her back on a small grass cot, shifted with extreme uncertainty. But will he accept it? Niambi crossed over to her and placed her glowing hands on her belly. It is by instinct and faith my people have survived as well, he began. Since the disappearance of Zalfir, our ancestors have instilled a nature of wariness in us, an unspoken vigilance to maintain our way of life against the unknown. True. But we have not forgotten that hundreds of years before, when Eirvek sought to destroy us all, faith in Asmira, our great prophet, who interpreted the visions and dreams of my father, who thought outside what was deemed the only path forward, brought us victory and life. Faith saved us then, and it will save us now. Our hands. Alara whispered, the gaze of worry slowly melting from her eyes. You feel like the sun. The baby gave another quick, another kick, but allowed its paw to remain outstretched, to linger in the warmth of Niambi's hand. Fear, Niambi continued, is like an icy wind that can turn the kindest heart cold. The magistrate is afraid of what he does not know. But a warm touch from a trusted friend can melt the ice. Mira, Alar's eyes brimmed with tears, were now back on the Ambi. Hope was burning in them. We know the stories. You're like her, aren't you? You're the one we must put our faith in. Alar turned to her sister, who still had her back to both. Fists were clenched tight, and he quaked with frustration. I don't know why it has that. It's like the second time they've misgendered uh, Zar. Sister, let her try one more time. The simple sound of Pilar's voice seemed to calm her. Her shoulders settled. Up till the moon is at its highest point in the sea. Then we go. Niambi immediately. She arrived at the magistrate's home just as the sun was beginning to set. It was a massive structure with a tile roof surrounded by orchards and gardens blooming acacia trees. The guard standing outside knew her. Been to his villa many times for dream interpretation, and they greeted her with a simple nod changed. However, as she went to pass them, crossed their spears in her path. What are you doing? Niambi asked. We are under attack, esteemed speaker. The tallest of the two soldiers spoke. We suggest you return to your home for your safety. I will be only a moment, Niambi responded. I come with new, dire news about the Phyrexian machine approaching. He is expecting me. Apologies, spoke the second. There is no admittance into the estate. We have orders. Niambi began, but halted her speech for half a moment. An idea 
forming. The eyes of the soldiers did not appear hardened. Their hearts were not immovable stones. They just needed some convincing. She shifted her focus back to the tall one. Your name is Esbo, is it not? It is, Esbo replied. Understand, I have not come here only for the sake of the magistrate, but out of concern for the subjects of his house, you in particular. Me? Esbo asked with fearful curiosity. Niambi nodded back at him. Yes, you and your role in the battle to save our city. Her hands had begun to glow. You see, I was plagued by such terrible dreams last night. I saw a doe trapped in a, bud of, a bed of mud. She called desperately to the fawn. She was meant to protect to stay away, promising she would soon be free and they could leave together. With each step she took, she sank deeper into the fagmire, her window of escape closing, not an escape from the earth meant to swallow her, but from an enormous beast that approached from the shadows. The fawn jumped about the perimeter of the muddy patch, unsure of what to do to save her, and unaware of the beast that had his eyes fixed upon him. He paused a moment. You know who you are in my dream, Esbo? Esbo shook his head with concern. Uh, the fawn! The second soldier chimed in. Miambi placed her glowing hands upon the hands that gripped the crossed spears. At the same time, the two inhaled, being filled with the light of the sun. You are the mud, said Neon. I am the doe. The magistrate is the fawn. I am trying to protect from the danger that will soon fall upon us. I am here to protect our dear magistrate. I only want to share with him the knowledge he needs to know before it is too late. Please release me. Touched by her words and the sun magic running through them, the guards allowed her through. Slipping through the front doorway, Niambi bounded down a long hall toward a large golden door at the end, the magistrate's chambers. Two servants in white robes were lighting torches along the hall, a young man and a young woman. They greeted her with a nod like the others, but as she passed, seeing the, ter the, seeing the determination in her face, one of them spoke up. Uh, the magistrate is not here, esteemed speaker, said the young woman. Niambi halted, turned to them. No? she asked, confused as to why the old man was gone at this hour. The sun is nearly set. He has not slept in his room for several days now. He's not slept at all, really, the young man chimed. Fear of the Phyrexian's return, I suppose. Fear. The wheels in Niambi's mind began to turn. Perhaps it was a pang of conscience, the guilt one might feel if they were to let a nation of innocent people perish that kept him awake. He couldn't help but feel a bit of satisfaction at the note. All of them should be ashamed for turning a blind eye to suffering, but then the feeling changed to a fear of her own. If the magistrate was indeed filled with shame, why had he not reversed his decision? His moments of sleeplessness were often triggered by bad dreams from the previous night. If it was this bad, why hadn't he summoned her? Someone else was in his ear. Where is he now? Nambia. The Great Chamber, answered the young woman. That is where he stays now. Even after council meetings have ended, he remains there, talking to himself a great Alone? asked Niambi. To start, the man responded. Then council members Kibega, Jabris, and Awate, Awate usually join his company. Indeed. Is it true that the that Phyrexians are hiding among the cat people outside the walls, esteemed speaker? asked the woman. There are our rumors. Niambi, burning with fury, rushed toward the door without giving an answer. 
She exited down the stone steps and entered the street, where she would have normally found a bustling scene of people heading to and fro. Found it empty. The people sheltered in their homes for fear of the invasion. However, at the end of the street was a single carriage and driver, awaiting a potential fare. She ran to the driver and climbed in. To the great chamber, please, she said, and the driver cracked the reins to set them. A short time later, Niambi arrived at the great chamber to find the magistrate seated on a fountain in the courtyard. The carriage waited in the front, the guards about the perimeter, each one familiar with her gift, having felt her warmth, saw her as a welcomed comfort to the ailing magistrate, and did not impede her march toward him. The feeble man was staring into the water, trembling beneath the weight of his heart. I have not been sleeping, said Neon, she approached. The magistrate slammed his staff on the stone-tiled ground, more to silence her than to stable himself. And you have been with them, he scolded, though his breathing was labored, his body hunched over. You have been consorting with the cat tribes when you are needed here with your people to quiet their spirits and convince them that the danger advancing on our borders is a mild one. He shot her a glare over his shoulders. It was a glare Niambi parried with, her, with a stern grimace of her own. A mild one, said Niambi. Hundreds will die. I... No, but... His resolve seemed to be crumbling in that moment. But... Whose spirit is the one that truly is quieting? Niambi asked, studying. Vishunda's eyes suddenly softened. He turned his face back to the fountain. Niambi could sense a yearning to express some deep truth. A biting anxiety he was holding in, and the need to speak was wafting off him, like waves of heat rising from the sand. Such... Her hands began to pulse, soft, gold light. When those of us who love and can love think on the preciousness of life, something will inevitably rise up to meet us. We love and can love, so we cannot ignore misery or turn a blind eye to suffering, especially when it is right at our doorstep. She placed her hand upon his, and the two of them sat in silence for a long moment. Ashunda turned his face to the heavens. The moon was near its highest point in the sky. Why have you not been sleeping? Niambi asked. The night after you came to council, Ashunda began after a I had the same dream about the wandering birds. Except this time, the tree was me. I saw my arms withered and full of holes. The insects were eating me alive, making their way inside my bones, my heart. I have never felt a pain in a dream, but in this one, I could feel everything. It was a pain that lingered when I opened my eyes. It has been inescapable, and that strangest part of all, in the dream, the little bird who came to me asked if I needed its help. I did need its help, desperately. I was dying, but I refused. I said, I don't know you, and it flew away. I have not been able to sleep since, Nyambi. Tell me what it means. Nyambi looked upon him with empathy, saddened by how this champion of Femereth had been sundered by nightmares and cruel gossip. Then a thought came to her. Better to ask forgiveness than permission. 
We stared up at the moon with him. Sure, Zar and her people be on the move. I would like you to come somewhere with me, he said softly. Where? he asked, looking to her. Turned to him as well, and smiled. To meet your bird. Moments later, when the two of them had settled into the seats of the carriage and the horses were readying to move, Niambi saw the doors to the great chamber open. Awate, Gabega, and Jabris exited. Awate's book was open, and the three were engaged in fervent conversation, probably deciding which new piece of history they could recite to further quiet the magistrate's conscience. The crack of the rain stole their, their attention. A magistrate? called Gabega, pointing at the carriage which was now on the move. Inyambi? called Ojabris. Straightened. You'll kill us all! screamed Awate, bounding toward his horse. The others quickly followed. The ride to the mine was long, and Niambi kept her hand in the magistrate's the entire time. With the warmth of the sun filling him, Tashunda dozed off to sleep. Niambi was thankful. With some welcomed reprieve from his troubled thoughts, a good dream, the old man could look on this situation with more compassionate eyes. The carriage jolted to a stop at the entrance of the mine, stirring the magistrate awake. He looked around, confused, unfamiliar with this section of the city, a secluded place surrounded by dust and high rocks. He did not panic, however. Niambi's hand was still glowing in his. The sound of a baby's cry stole their attention, bringing it to the dark opening of the mine, where the glow of torchlight was slowly penetrating the blackness. Was that a child in there, I hear? Ishunda asked amusedly. We can love and do love, dear Magister. Niambi replied, tears in her eyes. Alar had had her child. Let us go meet her. Two of them entered the mine and began a slow trek down the tunnel. Heart beaming with pride. Plan had worked. The Afravran would live. As they came closer to their destination, the sounds of laughter could be heard. Some gentle humming and the vocal hoisting of the last Afravran to safety. Right from the porches and the walls showed figures hugging one another and dancing with joy. Who are they? asked Tashunda. They are a people who needed someone to speak for them, because they are not allowed to speak for themselves. They are a people who needed someone to stand up for what is right and good and just. And though it might be hard. Ishunda looked at her. Who have you brought here? Birds in search of rest on an embittered tree. The magistrate's eye widened. Fear is, an incorrupt, is a corrupting emotion that withers the fruit that we are meant to give. That is what your dream means. The fruit you are meant to give is... Alvish. Chunda whispered softly. Niambi gave his hand a squeeze. Mother! Came a small voice from the shadows, as a man holding the hand of a teenage girl and a torch approached. Kikia, my darling! Niambi smiled, she and the magistrate meeting them halfway. The young girl was the spitting image of Niambi. She wore a golden headband that pushed her thick tufts of dark curls back. Denik, her father and Niambi's husband, was a handsome man of around fifty years. His hair was dreaded, fixed in a loose bun atop his head, and adorned with rings of gold. With a small smile, Niambi brushed a glowing hand over her daughter's cheek, which made her smile. Ikea leaned into the hand, 
accepting the warmth it provided just as Pilar's child had done. And our son, Mabutho? Niambi asked her husband. And our son, Mabutho? Niambi asked her husband. He and his wife are pour pouring water and giving blankets to... Denik gasped suddenly, bowing his head. He had Niambi. Why is the magistrate here? Niambi took the torch from him and placed it in Ashunda's hand. To see the truth, he said. With a gentle touch to Shunda's back, she allowed him to now lead the journey around the bend to the dancing Efavrin. Efravin, le. Almost immediately, he was brought face to face with Zar, who stood holding her crying niece. Alar stood beside her, one hand on her back and the other resting upon her daughter's head. The revelry ceased in it, and all went quiet as they beheld the newcomer in the midst. Ashunda stared at all of them, taking in the scene of mothers hugging their children to them, husbands shielding their wives, the entirety of a forlorn people silently praying for the right to exist. His eyes moved back to Thar, whose face remained hard as stone. The armor on the Efraven's body and the great sword sheathed upon her back told Dashunda all he needed to know about the woman. You are Ojanan, descendant of Jaeger and Jedit, champions of Jamora? I am, Thar replied firmly, standing taller, allowing the pride of her past to shine out of her. I revere them, said Dashunda softly. They were warriors who never wavered in their loyalty to their people, who fought the great fight to the very end. They truly inspired me, helped me. Leaders like them are the reason I am who I am today. I can say the same, Dar replied. Shunda, Shunda took in the child cradled in Zar's arm, swaddled in a blanket. His heart seemed to melt at the sight. And this is your child? Lark is her name, Alar replied. Like a little bird, she soared into this world, settled upon a dying tree, meant to do something wonderful. Miambi smiled as she held her own daughter. Her eyes met Pilar's, and the two of them nodded with thankfulness to one another. Ishunda looked back up at Zar, straightening. Zar Ojanan, what will you do when the Phyrexian abomination has been defeated? Where will you go? When the threat has passed, we will do what we have always done. Move on. No, you will not, said the magistrate sternly. The arrival of that machine is only the beginning, and in the wars to come, we will need loyal allies at our side. You will stay here. You will stay here with us. Magistrate, no! You can't! Came shouts from Awate, Jabris, and Gabega, who had suddenly entered the mine, and were now violently pushing their way through the crowd that had gathered around the magistrate. Sleeper agents! Sleeper agents are among them! They shouted together. Stop! Said Dushunda to the council members, who obeyed immediately. Obuk looking back at Niambi, he spoke again. We can no longer let our fear corrupt us. If an enemy finds his way in our midst, we must have faith that champions who stand among us will rise up and defeat them. Then, er, then he turned back, taking in the sea of hopeful, tear-filled eyes staring back at him, and said, Welcome, Ufemoref. Oh, that was so sweet. <laughs> oh my god. That was delightful. So sweet. 
<laughs> I really like that. What a, what a sweet and wonderful time. Uh, what and, and a good way to end the the block, or the set rather, because DMU has just been nothing but suspicion and betrayal and hatred. Sure, desperate survivors trying to do the thing, but nothing about them like really banding together beyond desperation and the requirement of defeating the enemy. Like this, this was really good. And like, <laughs> just a positive take on the whole thing about working together. You gotta, not just for your safety, but because you're people. Good together. <laughs>